when I was in uh, right out of college, I took a job in marketing. I was working in marketing while trying to grow my photography business at the time, while trying to, you know, be as active as I can within within my industry. I'm traveling constantly. I'm on the go. I'm eating heavy foods, and my weight started to really balloon up. And I ended up going to the doctor, James. You, you're overweight. You're on your way to becoming obese. Your blood pressure is dangerous. You are almost at the level of being pre-diabetic. And he says, why are you not sleeping? Why are you not taking care of yourself? And my excuse was, well, I'm trying to build my brand. And it was this realization that I had that once I give the time and devotion to honoring my physical health, then my mental acuity, then the relationships in my life, all of a sudden I have more time and more energy and more to invest into my business or into my brand or into this, into building something. Today's podcast guest is with internationally published photographer, best-selling author, and podcast host, James Patrick, whose intuition had him leave a corporate career to become successful in the professional photography industry. In this podcast interview, James and I talk about how his intuition helped him make a change to save his health, the intuitive moment that had him leave his corporate career, the doors of opportunity that opened up for him, and how he has used intuitive branding to find success in his photography business. In the show notes, I have a link to a website page where you can find out more about James, his website, and his social media profiles. Also in the show notes is a link to my calendar so that you and I can have a chat about how to implement intuitive branding in your organization that will have you leverage the power of intuition to earn the trust of those that matter in under 14 seconds, which is exactly how you completely eliminate your competition. Here's my interview with James Patrick. Great, um, and to start this uh, interview, I'll, g- I'll get you to introduce uh, yourself. So uh, who is James Patrick and what do you do? Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me on. My name is James Patrick. I am a internationally published photographer, best-selling author, and podcast host based in Phoenix, Arizona. Excellent. And so a couple of questions I always ask at the top of every interview. Uh, the first is, what is your definition of intuition? What do you think it is? You know, I spent a lot of time actually thinking about that. And one of the things that I've really been drawn to is Stoic philosophy. And when you think about Stoic philosophy, you really come down to there are three things that you're able to control. Only three things are within your your circle or sphere of control. One is your perceptions, what you take in. Okay. So your intakes or your environment. The second is your mindset, how you are choosing to see what is in front of you or how you're choosing to, to really analyze your environment. And then the third is the actions you take. So each one precedes the next. So your perceptions lead into your mindset, your mindset leads into your action. If those are the only three things that we control, then the question is, well, how does this correlate to intuition? Because my belief is intuition can be such a tremendously powerful tool if it's properly nurtured, if you properly nurture it with the right perceptions with the with the right mindset and then taking the right actions that i think is how i start to you know tap into what my definition of intuition is and how we can best leverage it excellent and and so each one of us have these things called intuitive signals and they're all going to be individual to us because our experiences are very unique when you're trusting intuition how does it feel like in the moment mm. for me it's it's two feelings. One, it's a strong sense of knowing what the choice is, right? You can look at like, let's just take a business decision, for example, you know what the right choice is, but right behind that signal or that intuition is that fear of what would happen if this didn't work out or what would happen if I'm wrong. And so oftentimes we find ourselves listening to the second voice and not the first voice. So usually it's the scarier thing is the right thing to do more often than not, because it's the sense that we know what's right. And that's why I think really honing in on your, the self-mastery of your perceptions, of your mindset, of your actions, gets you to understand the difference between those two voices. So you can have a lot more clarity in which decision is the right decision for you at any given moment. And what happens is when you, when you start getting into that, so the, the, the waiting game and you get into the fears, now your intuition shifts from a positive intuitive signal 
to a negative one because now you're making a decision that you shouldn't be making. And typically what intuition does is it'll start with a, a subtle negative signal. And as you continue to make decisions going against your intuition, those signals get louder and they sometimes change uh, to get to a point where you're saying, come on, buddy, uh, you know, what do I need to do? Do I get to, do I need you to be homeless? Do I need you to get a divorce? Do I need you to get into a car accident? I mean, these are some of the things that some of my guests shared. What are some of your negative intuitive signals and how bad did one get? You know, it's so interesting to try to unpack that. I look at, for me, I remember a couple of years ago, I was launching a new business and I remember going into launch, I was a little bit nervous. And the night before launching, I was, I was particularly snarky that day. And my wife was like, what's, what's going on? You're, you're a little more on edge than normal. I was like, well, we're investing a lot into this business. Um, what if this doesn't work? That was that secondary voice, that fear. What if, what if, right? Instead of saying what could be possible or think of all the what ifs that are in the positive, what would, what would happen if this didn't work? So all of a sudden this negative narrative starts to enter into, into the conversation. And it really started to wrap itself around my mind and consume my thoughts. So now I'm not seeing any of the potential positive, this only the negative. And I remember my wife says, well, Okay, so if it doesn't work out, you'll just do something else. And then she walked away. And that was it. And I, it gave me this pause. I was like, oh, yeah, I guess so. Because I've gone through this before. Things have not worked out before. I've had failures before. So if this doesn't work, I'll just do something else. And guess what? It did not work. Spoiler alert. Did not work. But we ended up shifting it, changing it to something else that did work. So I think so much of it is about understanding and taking that pause to step back to see what is my emotional response or my reaction to this? And why is it that, you know, I'll give another example where, you know, after everything we went through over the last 18 months, it has made business owners, entrepreneurs very, have a lot of trepidation about decisions they're making within their business. Okay. And I was feeling that myself too. Things that we had built and set up going into 2020 ended up working out really well for us. We were well diversified. We had the right services. We had the right portfolio set up to do really well throughout the quarantine, throughout the pandemic. But now as we're going into a new year, we're having to shift a lot of our businesses because the needs of consumers have changed, especially coming out after last year. And unless we evolve with it, well, will be where a lot of businesses were at the start of 2020, which is behind the curve, okay? And that brings up a lot of fear of, well, what if, negative thought, what if it was pure luck that we were diversified? What if it was pure luck that we did so well? What if all the success we've had before was just random chance? And that negative thought can amplify itself and prevent you from taking the actions that you need to take. So I think so much of it to answer your question is to be able to give yourself that space to pause and really reflect, why am I feeling the way I'm feeling about this as opposed to just taking that feeling at its surface value? Did you ever have sort of the, the ultimate signal where things got so bad that you just had to change? Uh, and, and the reason why I ask this is when I I've interviewed over probably about 1,200 people now, uh, and the vast majority of them, when they res the, the time that they respect what intuition does uh, or has for them or delivers for them is that when either they're personally at a time in their life where there's only way they can go up or the circumstances around them or surround them is saying that there's only one way you can go, and that is up because something happens to them. What In your case, did you have that? particular thing happened to you? And if so, what was that ultimate signal for you? I think there's a lot of those. Okay. Really like, like two came to mind right away. Okay. Uh, and the two that came to mind right away was, um, when I was in, uh, right out of college, I took a job in marketing. I was working in marketing while trying to grow my photography business at the time while trying to you know, be as active as I can within, within my industry. I mean, it was to the point where I wasn't, um, burning the candle at both ends. I just threw the candle in the fire. Now there was always excuses as to why certain things within my own health and wellness were not getting done because, well, 
I get up at 5 a.m. every day. I'm in my office by 6 a.m. every day or 6.30 at the latest. I'm working till about six o'clock at night. Then I got a networking meeting after that, or I have to meet with a client. I got to wine and dine something. There's another mixer that's happening. So I'm traveling constantly. I'm on the go. I'm eating heavy foods. Uh, and my weight started to really balloon up. Uh, and I wasn't sleeping well probably from alcohol and heavy foods and never really resting or allowing myself to rest. And I ended up going to the doctor just saying, you know, I feel tired. I don't have energy. The doctor is like, James, you, you're overweight. You're on your way to becoming obese. Your blood pressure is dangerous. You're and at the time I'm in my early twenties. Why do I have dangerous blood pressure? It says your blood sugar you are almost at the level of being pre-diabetic. If you don't make a change fast, you'll be diabetic. Like this is what's in front of you. And he says, why are you not sleeping? Why are you not taking care of yourself? And my excuse was, well, I'm trying to build my brand. I'm trying to build my business. I'm, I'm in this hustle, this hustle mentality. And it was this realization that I had that if I take this idea of, you know, we, we, our normal approach is, well, I'll give time for my health and wellness once I achieve something in business or whatever. I'll give time for my mindset once I achieve something down here. I'll give time for relationships. I'll make space for relationships once I do something really great or really substantial. And what I learned is that funnel actually needed to flip. That once I give the time and devotion to honoring my physical health, then my mental acuity, then the relationships in my life, all of a sudden I have more time and more energy and more to invest into my business or into my brand or into this, into building something. And it took that moment or that conversation with that doctor to really start to realize that, no, this needs to, this needs to shift. This needs to flip. And I never would have allowed that into my ecosystem had that conversation not happened. Uh, so that's one of the ones that just jumps in front of my mind right away. Mm, that's amazing. Um, <clears throat> dangerous as well. I mean, because I think so many people, the other, the other aspect of that is, and you mentioned taking action as well. Many people are not many, but some are confronted by that same news, but they fail to take action on that. And they seem to have the same, they seem to want to go back on that same hamster wheel uh, mm -hmm. thinking that, they know best whether the, and even though the doctor is saying that something's going on, uh, they don't want to make that change. What to you actually had you take action or was it just your mindset saying, I need to take action? What were some of the other factors getting you to say, yeah, I got to change? You know, the same actions are only going to yield the same results is part of it. And I understand that as a business owner, that if I want different results, I cannot achieve different results by just continuing to do the same thing. And working just harder doing the same thing is what got me into that position to begin with. So I understand that there needed to be a fundamental change in how that happened. Now, sometimes that change can happen gradually because it's so hard to just like have this shift where all of a sudden it's like, okay, all of a sudden now I'm going to eat really clean and now I'm going to meditate every day and I'm going to journal and I'm going to invest in relationships. Well, that's a lot of changes that you're trying to make at once. And that's a really great way to set yourself up to maybe do it for a day or two, maybe a week at most, until you start to resort back to those old habits because those habits are ingrained in us. And even though we might take short-term action, we're not creating long-term shifts. So my approach was to build small shifts in my life, little, little simple things that I could do that would not really change a lot, but by doing it, it created a new thought process or a new way to look at. So, and I'll give an example, uh, with my physical health, I broke it down to movement and, and nutrition. But if I'm in this one modality of always being on the go, always eating out all this stuff, it's going to be hard to all of a sudden eat, you know, this hyper clean diet. So if I did something like, well, if I just had a green juice a day, you know, a, 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 a low to zero sugar green juice for nutrition. And if I sweat for 20 minutes a day, well, that right there is enough to at least get something done. Now, does sweating 20 minutes a day get me in shape? It does not. But when I start to sweat for 20 minutes a day without excuse, guess what? That 20 minutes turns into 60 almost every single day. 
almost every day. When I drink a green juice every day, does drinking a green juice change the nutrition going into my body? It doesn't. It's just a green juice. But guess what? It makes me more aware of the rest of the food I'm putting in my body for the rest of the day. Okay. It makes me cognizant of that. It's that anchor. I could do that with mindset. You know, I will meditate for 60 seconds. Does meditating 60 seconds give me mental clarity and peace of mind throughout the day? Absolutely not. But it makes me more mindful throughout the day. Or guess what? That 60 seconds turns into six minutes, turns into 30 minutes often. Does journaling a page a day, which is my limit, you know, or my minimum, a page, does that change anything? No. But it gets me into the habit of doing something. And these small little shifts can create bigger results just because they're, they're almost cues that remind you throughout the day. Uh, but to get back to the, the thing of action, like we, are, are, we have no shortage. And I see this in, in the business industry. We have no shortage of great ideas. Like we are awash with great ideas. I hear great ideas from potential entrepreneurs all day long, like ideas for books, ideas for podcasts, ideas for new programs or modules or courses or services. We're awash with ideas. What we do not have is an abundance of action on those ideas. And without action, your ideas stay just that. They stay ideas. And thinking that if I, even if someone goes and builds something, you know, we'll just look at, well, I built this great book but they never publish it. I recorded, I've heard this. I've heard people say that they've recorded 30, 40, 50 episodes of a podcast that they've never released, that they never hit print on, that they never hit publish on just because they're trying to perfect it, right? That's what we're missing is we're missing the actual action that takes what your idea is and puts in front of the people who need to see it. Wow, that's, that's really, really great <clears throat> because I think it gets it gets to that sort of next level where you actually have to take action. We'll talk about this is one of the questions coming up. Um, now, you were also in a corporate career and your intuition kept gnawing at you, I believe, uh, to get out. Um, when did these signals start? And did you actually have an intuitive wake-up call moment that had you finally take the plunge to go into photography full-time? So there were several, actually. Okay. And... You know, I, I looked at, you know, I spent seven years in corporate America and over the course of those seven years, there was this scale of dissatisfaction. Now, when you start a new job, it's going to be a zero or a one. And that's where I was. I love my job, you know, uh, granted all seven years, I actually love my job. I wasn't satisfied with my job, but I love my job. And as I was going on, and then you deal with the bureaucracy of working with others, or, you know, especially when the economy started getting tight, you know, and, and projects start becoming a lot more rare, and you start seeing employees let go. I mean, our office went from our, the office we were in, we had 140 some employees. And by the time we hit the recession, we were at 39, like we lost 100 100 team members, that level of dissatisfaction starts to grow and started to grow really fast. Probably after about four years, I was maybe a five or a six. After five years, probably a six or seven, seven, eight, eight, nine. And by the time I left, I was at a nine going into a 10. Like I was really unsatisfied with my job. Now, what's interesting is whenever I'd go to these networking events or, or mixers or things like that, and people you know, exchanging business cards and all that, and people say, what do you do? I would always say my corporate job. And that was this interesting signal to me, which is, I feel that saying my corporate job is what I do is a safe answer. But saying I'm a photographer, I'm trying to grow my business photographer, that's a risky answer. People might ask too many questions about that. I might get judged for that. Who am I to be a photographer? Imposter syndrome and the whole and the whole mix, right? But I remember being at a mixer. At this point, I was probably five or six years into my career. And someone asking that and saying, and it just came out of my mouth. I didn't even think about it. Just I'm a photographer. And there was this great light bulb moment that, wow, I just made a shift. That was an amazing breakthrough that I just had where I identified in the role that I wanted to have, not the role that I was in at that very moment. Okay. So then it became, okay, how can I make this happen? All right. Now, flash forward, I had tried to leave this corporate job maybe three or four times, right? But chickened out. I chickened out because of that secondary fear that voice that came back in my head that says, well, you know, the economy's getting tough right now. And you know what? At least you have it good. Like 
that you got a good, you got a good paycheck, you got freedom, you got your evenings, you got your weekends, you know, you got great vacation time because I was cashing out all my vacation time and all my sick time on my, on my photography business at that point. I was working two full-time jobs. Uh, I went in and this was, it was the last day before Thanksgiving. I remember this. I went in and I had my uh, annual review with my boss and in this annual review, uh, he had to go through kind of my stats and how I was doing in the year. And he says, you know, your numbers are good. Your win ratios are, are good. Uh, you know, you're doing fine. And then came to the point where he says, well, now I have to read you the responses from the other office leaders based on your, eval- your performance in the last year. And I said, okay. He says, well, for the most part, they're good. Now, in seven years, I had never had nothing but glowing reviews. So this is the first time that there was a kind of a lead in for the most part. So I says, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you know, two guys are in a bad mood. You know, don't worry about it. I says, no, what do you mean? What, what were the comments? And he says, well, don't read into this too much. Like I said, they probably, probably caught him on a bad day. He says, well, what were they? The one was um, James has become disgruntled and difficult to work with. I was like, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. I had, you know, I mean, I was at a nine or a 10 at that point on that dissatisfaction scale. I'm like, okay, that's fair. I have. I was like, what was the other one? And he really did not want to read this other one to me. I says, read it anyway. And this quote was, I've lost all faith in James's ability to run our marketing department. That was the quote. And the quote had absolutely nothing to do with me. There's a subtext there of the person was mad that I didn't do a project that they wanted me to work on. Didn't matter. But right at that moment, I sat back in my chair after just hearing that. And I said, okay, I turn in my notice. And it required that push for me to make that leap, for me to finally get to that point to be like, you know what? I can do this because what is the worst thing that's going to happen? I was being headhunted by other companies. So the worst thing that would ever happen is I just go get a job doing the same thing I do at another company. That's the literal worst thing that could happen. Okay. The best thing that could happen is what did happen, which is the work I was able to do. And after I said, okay, I turned in my notice, my boss in in the coolest fashion sat back in his chair. He took a sigh and he smiled and said, I'm surprised it took you that long. That was that insight that I should have done this earlier. I just wasn't ready. I needed that push to get there. Wow. So signs were there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When you trust your intuition and you made this leap uh, to become the entrepreneur and you're actually taking action and things like that. So you're actually doing entrepreneurship because there's so many people who call themselves entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs and they just kind of stop there. And, um, and, you're, and you're making these decisions based on intuition. What starts to happen is the doors of opportunity start to flood in. Um, and the big thing is that you got to make sure that you're turning the doorknobs of those doors of opportunity to actually open the doors. What were some of these opportunities that you were presented with and how did this really kind of accelerate your business? I love how you phrased it because you and I were so simpatico in how we see it. You talk about opening doors. I always call them unknown roads okay. and you're going down a road and all of a sudden an unknown road opens up to you and you're like, well, I don't know where this is going to go, but I feel a pull to walk down this road. And we look at how this has precipitated over the last, I mean, 10 plus years, I, I started to combine together a lot of the skill sets I had. So what started just as a career in photography and growing a business in photography, all of a sudden there was that question, you know, I have a background in marketing. What if I helped all the clients I have in their marketing as well? Like that's something no one else is doing. What if I did that? And all of a sudden we were able to launch this conference called Fitposium that we're going into our seventh year. We've had attendees from over seven countries. We've had over 1500 people go through our conference in the last seven years. Okay. That is amazing. But that was an unknown road that we just asked, what would happen if, uh, what would happen if a lot of my clients need support with graphic and web design? What would happen if I just hired an amazing graphic and web designer to help my clients with that. Well, we were able to open up a business doing that. What would happen if I were to put some of my ideas and some of my experiences on paper and release a book? Well, that became a best-selling book. 
All right. So you can start to see like we have eight businesses right now because we had asked what would happen if, and then we took the action that we felt compelled to take. Now, were there things that didn't work out? Absolutely. You know, when we talked about that, there were projects we launched, didn't work out. There were businesses we tried to get off the ground, didn't, didn't get momentum. That's fine. I will say that, you know, in doing this, as long as I've been doing it, there's this misinterpretation that entrepreneurs have confidence. We don't at all. I am just as terrified. I'm launching a new business right now. I have a business partner. I, we're launching a business. It's probably the most expensive launch I've ever done. And there's a chance that this could not work, right? Of course, there always is. I'm as terrified launching this business as I was back when I chickened out quitting my corporate job. All right. That fear feels the exact same. It sounds the exact same. It tastes the same. Okay. The difference is, is I now have the hindsight and the understanding of what it means to listen to my intuition versus that secondary voice or that voice of fear, which is trying to keep you in that status quo. Like right here is just fine. You know, we know what this is because the truth is, is like, we know what failure feels like. We also know what success feels like. Those are neither of those are alien feelings to us. What we, I think, fear the most is just unknown. We just have no idea. Right. And I think that fear of the unknown is what keeps us ignoring that intuition. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there's actually fear, three fears that I've identified uh, in the research I've done and, and the people I've talked to. Fear of the unknown is a big one, uh, but it's also fear of failure and fear of change. Uh, mm -hmm. And it sounds like in, in, in your journey, you've kind of had, you've hit all those three fears at different points or maybe all together in one. You just, it's just not broken down as much. Um, in the photography area, there's obviously there's a creative aspect that you you absolutely require. But uh, in any business, there's always this fallacy that if if you when you're trying to get things perfect and you build it, they will come. Right? And I think you've talked about this on uh, on another podcast of your own. Um, and so you have to have that creative aspect that's really really balanced by that that business aspect, and they really have to flow. But to gain business, there's this thing that I call called intuitive branding. And in, in what, what intuitive branding is, is the ability to create two-way trusted relationships where not only you're using your intuition to make sure that you select, uh, you're, you're treating people right, you have the right intentions, you're not always selling. Because what happens is when you're using your intuition to make those decisions, um, you're selecting the right people, but the, the p other people, their intuition is always on as well. It's a two-way trusted, it's a two-way street. So if you're going in with the wrong intentions, um, their intuition is going to get tripped to say, he's always selling. He doesn't care what I want. Um, I don't trust his brand. I don't trust his, and they can go down the rabbit hole. So if you want to build your business, you got to earn that trust by leveraging intuition. And the research that I've seen, that I've personally seen in the papers, happens in under 14 seconds, 10 to 14 seconds. And in fact, I just saw a paper this week that showed, uh, this was done at a, in the UK, 33 milliseconds. Wow. 33 milliseconds is how quick it takes someone to establish trust. What have you done to earn the trust that has you become successful in your businesses? The way I look at building a business, I break it down into three pillars. One is awareness. The second is reinforcing value. And the third is conversion. It goes without saying that consumers only purchase when they are ready to purchase, which is not when we as the people selling want them to purchase. Okay. So the first pillar is awareness. I, I really separate the, the difference between an audience and a lead. I have lots of people in my audience. It doesn't make them leads. doesn't make them willing to purchase. A lead is someone who's invested back into you, who's raised their hand, who's signaled back, okay? A lead is someone who is further along the trust and rapport cycle than just an audience member, all right? From there, reinforcing value. Reinforcing value to me is about showing up for my leads even when they haven't invested in me. And I feel like that is what builds the trust and rapport. The fact that you never have to swipe a credit card with me to learn from me. You never have to purchase from me in order to get value from me. The fact that I'm going to show up for my audience 
multiple ways, multiple times a week. The fact that if someone subscribed to my podcast, they're going to get three of my podcasts sent to them every week that are crammed full of value that I put a lot of work in and they don't have to pay for that. And why are they getting a podcast today? Because today's Wednesday. It's just that simple. All right. So that I have consistently shown up and given value. And on top of that, have made a unique position of what my brand is going into it. Okay. I am not just a photographer. I'm the photographer who gets published. I'm not just a business coach. I'm the business coach who can help you leverage media to grow your business. Okay. So I've carved out that unique position and I have thousands and thousands of examples that reinforce that. And the fact that I show up in my podcast, in my videos, in my blog, in my newsletter, in my articles, fill in the blank to reinforce that position. Now I'm not only building the right awareness from the right audience, but I'm constantly reinforcing my value to that audience. Okay. This is what builds that trust and rapport so that by the time there's a chance for a conversion, okay, which is that third pillar they're 80% sold. By the time I get someone on a sales call, they're 80% sold. And all I have to do is ask them what their next step is. And they will tell me what the next step is. All right. I will not jump on calls unless I'm, I'm at that 80% mark with someone because you know what? They need to be nurtured longer or they need to get more value from me. This is how I've had clients for 10 years. This is how I have high ticket clients who constantly reinvest in our programs. It's because we constantly show up at every step of the way. You can look at the consumer journey and break out the consumer journey into multiple points. You have, you have awareness, you have value transaction, you have a subscription model, you have conversions, you have ascension, which is ascending them up the, the portfolio of offerings. But the step that underlines everything is nurture. You nurture at every step of the way from the second someone finds out who you are to the second they become a client and then beyond, you are always nurturing because consumers are way too savvy. There's way too many options for them and they'll just go somewhere else, right? So we have to respect our consumers at every step of the way. That's amazing. Um, in 2008, there was a big recession um, mm. and you really had to focus on your vision. And this is stuff that, uh, I mean, intuition is not going to predict anything like that. This, that. this is stuff that happens to you. Um, or in some cases, some people say it happens for you, depending on how you want to look at it. But it's, it's something that's beyond your control. What was your vision that had you kind of stick, stick out and become successful, even though we had a recession where a lot of businesses went belly up? Yeah. I almost put my camera up in 2008 because my business was going down. At mm. that time, I was a jack of all trades photographer. I photographed fashion and portraiture and commercial work and architecture and, and, and landscapes and family portraits. And it didn't matter if it involved a camera and a subject. I was, I was trying to get that job and I was doing reasonably well, but it's 2008. A lot of my clients are going out of business and I'm looking at this. I'm like, well, I guess maybe I could put my camera up on the wall. I hadn't left my corporate job at this, at this time. So I was like, well, I guess I'll just do my marketing job. And photography was a fun hobby for a while, but it kept gnawing at me. Like you're not done with this. There's something else here. So I started to do a little research on industries like booming industries that were going on, not because I was trying to find what my future in photography was just because I'm a very curious person. I like to read a lot and I'm always, I'm always in a mode of study. And so I'm reading business magazines and trade publications. And what I'm reading is that the health, fitness, and wellness industry is about to erupt and explode. And I start thinking about that. I'm like, okay, here's an industry that I'm reading in Forbes and an entrepreneur and an ink magazine that's about to get huge. There's going to be more personal trainers, more gyms, more health clubs, more spas, more nutrition companies opening than ever before in history. Well, what could I do as part of this? And I started to think about this and I was like, well, as a photographer, it's the thing I love doing the most, which is working with athletes. I love working with athletes. I love working with people in, in health and wellness and fitness and sports. And I started thinking, I was like, well, no one else is really like, there's no fitness photography as an industry, but what if I just did like fitness portraiture and sports portraiture? Like, what if I honed in on that? And if I'm going to hone in on that and I'll just do only that. And I was assuming I'll do only that. And it would just be like my small little side hustle while I kept my main job. Right. 
But if I'm going to do it, I got to be the best at it. And the best at it meant, well, I need to be proactive, not reactive. What are the clients that would hire this type of photographer? And I would write them all out. Like, what are the magazines? What are the newspapers? What are the ad agencies? What are the commercial companies based here in Arizona? I started local. And then every lunch break and after work every day, I pick up the phone, I start calling them. And I would say, hi, my name is James Patrick. I'm a sports and fitness portrait photographer. Uh, I see that you have this work in your publication or that you do ads like this. I would like to share some work samples with you to see if we could work together. And one by one, I started to get people say, yeah, send some stuff over. And then one by one, I started to say, you know what? Yeah, we could use you. Because photo directors, photo editors, creative directors, editors, they're always looking for new, something new, something different, something that can give value to them. And I'm offering value. Okay. And I started to get these gigs and these local gigs turned into a statewide, which turned into regional, which turned into national, which turned into international. As this industry started to erupt, I went with it. And my business skyrocketed as a result. I mean, it was like, I don't know, five, six X growth in a single year during the recession, which gave me that chance of working two full-time jobs at once, which gave me that understanding that if I quit this corporate job, I'm just fine. I'm just fine with where I'm at right now. Uh, and that's when I made that transition over. But it was, it was a mix. It was a mix of constantly having my head on a swivel to see what's happening around me. What, are the, what, what is changing? And then asking, how can I act in this and be proactive in this versus reactive in this? And there was an example of when it really worked out. And even right now, we're looking at, okay, 2020 was a crazy year for everyone, not even just in business, for everyone, right? But as someone who owns a business or runs a business, as we're coming into now, we're halfway through 2021, uh, rolling right through 2021, going into 2022. What is shifting in our industry? What's shifting in technology? What's shifting in consumer behavior? What's shifting in consumer demand? And how can we be at the forefront of that? And I think the more you can ask that question, the more you are going to evolve. I think you have two types of business owners. You have business owners, like I saw this in the photography industry. When I got into photography, it was this, the shift between film and digital. And there are all these photographers who say, real pros will never shoot digital. Well, consumer demand needed digital assets. So unless you shot digital, you became irrelevant. I saw it again with social media. Real clients will never hire a photographer off, at the time, MySpace, right? Well, guess what happened? Consumer demand dictated that we wanted to hire our professionals off social media. And I saw it again in 2008, where photographers were complaining that the reason the industry was struggling was not because of a recession, not because of changes in what consumers were demanding. It was because there are too many new young professionals that were entering the market, giving away too much for too little and reducing the value of the assets. And they had it backwards. It wasn't new people entering the industry that were changing the industry. It was what the consumers wanted. And there were new professionals willing to adapt faster to what consumers wanted, which was different assets, more assets, different types of usage rights, all these different things. Well, now we're seeing it again right now. And if we want to stand at the edge of the world and wave our arms and hope everything goes back to the way it used to be, we'll continue to be waved over by change. But if you can stay adept and stay at the forefront and constantly have your head on a swivel or constantly look, see what's coming up next and how can I change to that, then change becomes the normal. It doesn't become something that is uncomfortable. Yeah, and I think it's <clears throat> very much uh, about, uh, yeah, and so the whole issue with Darwin and, and how people say it's, it's uh, you know, survival of the fittest, it's, it's actually the survival of the ones most adapted to change. Uh, and I think a lot of people miss that. I was just telling my two girls, that. I mean, they're nine and 14, they're still young, but uh, you know, they hear about intuition all the time at home. So they, at some point they roll their eyes, but uh, they're both running businesses now. So um, that's amazing. Yeah. So my, my 14 year old uh, now she's got a nonprofit and she's raised over $30,000 for those with disabilities and illnesses. Uh, it's an official Canadian nonprofit. And my uh, youngest nine, <clears throat> She wants to run a business, so she sings, and Taylor Swift is her inspiration. And Taylor Swift donated to Sick Kids in, in Australia. And so she's, uh, I want to do this as well. Can I donate to Sick Kids in Toronto? And I said, well, um, prove to me you're serious. And so you have to raise $500 before we even 
start you with any kind of like, we'll start probably with a Shopify account. Uh, and here, you know, three days later, she raised over $220. She's got a, a Zoom pitch tomorrow with uh, a buddy of mine who's in another part of the country. Um, and she's basically locked up in one week. She's locked up 500 bucks. Um, and how so, does that, how does that feel like as, as a father kind of seeing this, this legacy kind of come to fruition? For me, it's about them being so confident in trusting and I, I couch it in intuition, but it's, they're trusting themselves. They're making those decisions. They're not worrying what other people think. They're really saying, I can do this. Uh, I have a vision. I, and she, you know, they've had people saying, I want to join your business. And then they've, they, they've got the friends that start making excuses or don't want to ask their parents. So those, those mini tells are coming intuitive signals, right? So mm -hmm. I'm teaching them how to kind of decode what intuition is for them. Um, so that they can actually move ahead. And my my youngest, or sorry, my oldest, 14, uh, she actually has a podcast series. Uh, so you'll probably be getting an email from her to get her. And it's about how art and creativity has infused into um, into people's lives. And I was just telling her about you and saying, here's a photographer. This is a perfect thing about art and creativity. But she's also interviewed people, somebody who had thalidomide, had no arms. So he had to be creative to live. The FBI agent who uh, had the Unabomber um, arrested because of forensic linguistics. She talked for about an hour and five minutes with him on how art and creativity was essential to catch this guy. Um, and so she's having these phenomenal conversations with others who are realizing how much art and creativity has infused in their lives. And she's also realizing how, wow, I didn't realize the stuff that I do really affects people's professions and their lives. So these aha moments are ones as a father. Um, so it's like, wow, like I, I get surprised. And then their confidence is something that gives me a great legacy to leapfrog off of so that, you know, my job as a parent, I think, is more or less done. Do I make mistakes as a father? Absolutely. Um, but, you know, uh, it's that entrepreneur, 51% success, 49% failure. If I can teach them these ropes early on, can you kind of imagine where they're going to be later? You know, I love the, so. the the beauty of these real world experiences that they get to have with, you know, you get to apply this guidance and just see it, you know, in your own kids. I mean, uh, my wife and I were expecting our first later this year, and it's just Imagine. so amazing to hear from from other parents about how they're imparting their knowledge or their experiences into the lives of their kids in such unique ways. I think that's amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate that. You can see some of the, the art behind me here. I was this, noticing. Yeah. 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 So of course I proudly show what they have. And pretty soon I'll probably have a bookmark in my, uh, in my pocket because my, my daughter's got two bookmarks where she designed specifically um, and sent Toronto sick kids in, in Toronto love them. So they said, Oh, these are so much. So it's amazing. So, uh, so let's see where that goes. Um, but yeah, the, it, it's just the, the legacy that, that you want to do. But, but I think the other thing that, comes is one of the things I'm trying to get them to do is to really understand what business is about. And it's about those relationships. And when you have these things, when, when you have others trying to grow their business, I mean, my kids are one example, but there are some common mistakes that other entrepreneurs make that prevent them from earning that trust. And you, you've, you've mentored a lot of people um, just in the, in the podcast I've listened to and, and how you've talked. What are some of the common mistakes that you've seen that people make? I think it, the biggest one overall is it is going for the short-term gain versus the long-term mutual benefit. Okay. And I read a book uh, by David Meister. It's like 20 years ago. And it, it acquitted it to the difference between a one night stand and a marriage. And you have businesses that are built on transactions called one night stands. And there are certain businesses that can succeed in a transactional based relationship. Like, you know, take, take your fast food joint. They do not need to build a relationship with you because there's another transaction right behind you. Unfortunately, for all the listeners of the show and for, for a lot of the people they're trying to reach, we are not hiring a transactional business. We want a relational business. Okay. And if we are running our business in a transaction mindset, and I've made the mistake of doing this, to be clear, we're, we're going for the sale. And then once we make that sale, we're on to the next sale. And as a salesperson, there's an intoxication that comes with that. 
Okay. Where you're focused on your numbers and you're focused on, well, I made this sale and now I need to go into the next sale. So the lines of what you sell and how appropriate it is to sell it to a person, they can become blurred. So I can understand that. All right. But having hindsight and that gift of hindsight and going through those experiences, I understand now that I would rather decline a sale if it means a longer term benefit with that client. All right. And I look at a relationship loop as having a few different parts. One is you have to know what that person needs, truly needs, not what you, not what they think they need, but truly what they actually need to achieve their goals. Because every person I talk to has an aspirational identity, somewhere they want to go. And I coach a lot of people in the health and fitness space. Well, the people they talk to, there's an aspirational identity of what they want to achieve and why they want to achieve it. So it's honing in on knowing what that is. From there, it's about demonstrating that you can support them. And that demonstration is done through your content marketing, it's done through your emails, it's done through your social media, it's done through your podcast, it's done through your, your proposals or your pitches to them. All of it is demonstrating that I understand where you're at, I understand where you want to go, and I know that I have the bridge between the two. Okay, so you demonstrate your expertise. Then comes the delivery. You have to deliver and you have to super deliver. Making the sale is not where the work ends. It's where it begins because you have to reinforce why they took a chance on you. Anyone who invests in me, whether it's investing you know, $20,000 into a coaching program or whether it's subscribing to my podcast and just investing their time, they invested something. And unless I honor that investment, I lose them forever. Okay. That's why if I have a bad podcast interview, it's not airing because I do not want to waste the investment of my listeners who put that time in. When someone invests into a coaching or into a mastermind or attending one of our conferences, I'm going to work so hard to validate that investment, all right? Because I care about that investment. And then the fourth thing, which is I think where a lot of people trip up is I stay in touch. I stay in touch with my clients. And we lose out on so many opportunities if we do not stay in touch. You know, by the time a client finishes a project, we're just on to the next client or on to the next sale. No, you stay in touch because when you stay in touch, you have a further, a deeper, a more intimate understanding of what they need next. And if you understand what they need next, you are already first in line to be the one to propose yourself to deliver what they need next. This is why I have had clients for up to 10 years, because I will stay in touch. I will find out what they need next. I will see how I can serve them again. This is why I can have people go from buying my book to attending my conference, to joining my mastermind, to then going into one-on-one coaching with me in that order, back to back to back to back, because we honor them. We nurture them at every step of the way. You know, I had this one magazine client and the only reason they're not a client anymore is because the magazine doesn't exist anymore. But I worked for him for 10 years. And for 10 years, I shot every cover that this magazine did for 10 years. And one day, this is maybe half of the way through, the art director says to me, he says, you know, I've never worked with a photographer as long as I've worked with you. Now, that was a compliment. And it was also a threat. I've never worked with a photographer as long as you. It means congratulations. You've earned my relationship, my business for the last several years. I've never worked with a photographer as long as you, which means I can change my mind at any point. If there's someone who gives me more value or shows up better than you show up, that was a challenge that I took. And it says, yeah, I'm going to reinforce. You will never find another photographer as long as you found, you know, working with me. That's how I look at it. Like we have to honor these clients and we have to look at these clients as a real relationship. And if that means like I had a, I had a client sale uh, last week, uh, or I should say, I did not have a client sale last week. This person wanted to invest a high dollar value into my coaching program, and I turned them down. And I turned them down because I did not think they were ready for that program. And I put them in a program that was one one hundredth of the investment. So I lost 99% of that investment right there, but it was the right decision because they would have been too stressed out in this higher program. They would have not have had the results that I needed them to have in this higher program. Yeah, I would have gotten a payday, but I would have lost that client's business for the rest of their life, 
or for the rest of their business. I put them in a lower program. And just this morning, I got an email from them thanking me for putting them in this lower program and bragging about all the success they've been having in the lower program. And my hope is, is that they can get enough success in this lower program that in four or five months, I can bring them up to the next program. That's how we want to honor our clients. Mm, and and it's really important because, and, and this is where this, you know, every step of the way with the statistics that I show, you know, that relationship takes, you know, milliseconds to even think about, and that has to happen on a consistent basis. And when you do that, then you actually don't become a threat. I mean, that's how kind of how you crush the competition, because if you're doing things right, nobody else is doing what you're doing because it's about the relationship. It's not about the photography. It's not about the coloration. It's not nothing about that. It is about you and that other person. And that's the stronghold. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, I, I've never said I'm the most creative photographer. I wouldn't say it cause I'm not. And I would never say I'm the, the most technical photographer cause, cause I'm not, but I'm the photographer who will work the hardest to build the right relationships and we have, we have a statement in my business. We do not take pictures. We make images that work. And the difference between those two is not semantics. It's I understand because I've worked in the back end of, of how images are used. And I will, not, I will work harder to make the right images, not just the best looking images, not just, the, no, I will make the images that work and the images that work mean the images that work for you, your brand and your goals. That is how we differentiate ourselves. And when you can have that differentiation and you can have that unique position where you can say, I can do this, and you say it with confidence, that right there starts to build that trust with your audience. And I think that's so important. Mm, this is bringing up a podcast interview I had with a fellow by the name of Walid Azima. Um, and Walid was, so his intuition told him to pick up a camera. Like he just had no clue, no experience. And he goes into this video shoot with Usher uh, and he starts, uh, he has no, nothing, he doesn't even know what F-stop is. And he starts <laughs> taking pictures all over the place. And the only ones he could do was in Photoshop was black and whites because the other 800 were all ruined. Uh, but for some reason, that was exactly what Usher wanted for his new cover album. And he got a call from his manager saying, would you want to be the professional photographer for Usher? Uh, and that started his career to work with J-Lo and, and um, you know, Kanye West and the whole bit. Um, it's just a phenomenal uh, interview on intuition photography. I thought you might appreciate that. Um, we talked about earlier about failure. Uh, and failure being absolutely necessary in order for success to happen. In fact, it is necessary because your intuition learns all of the things that you've done and the decisions you've made and the actions you've taken that led to the failure, which are great things because one of the four types of intuition is called experiential intuition. And it goes into this library to see what you have and haven't done. So failure is just a marker to say, if you're going to do this again, I'm going to send you a negative signal because somewhere, somehow in the past, you or someone else you've seen has made those decisions before. What was the biggest failure that you experienced and what lessons did you learn from that? I mean, I, I think I could do an entire book <laughs> on things that didn't work out yeah. because we can look at failure and I could look at failure as like the times where it's really funny in hindsight. Like um, there was a time that I finally got a starting position on my high school football team only to fumble the ball the second I touched it. Uh, there was the time that I got fired from selling candy apples at a mall kiosk because after one shift, I ate more apples than I sold. Um, there was the time I got turned down from an entry-level position at Radio Shack because they didn't see enough potential in me to sell headphones and portable CD players. Like stuff like that, I can look at and like, yeah, those are some pretty big failures uh, that are funny in hindsight. Uh, then there are the times that we have failure that we don't like to talk about, right? Uh, you know, and the, uh, the, the example of being told by someone you worked with that they do not see any potential of you running their marketing department in the future. Like there's a sting to that. And that's not, you know, I can talk about it now, but I didn't like to talk about it then. Or the fact that when I tried to launch my conference that I was bragging about like a half hour ago, when I tried to first launch it, it didn't work. It didn't work. We tried to launch in June of 2015. And the week before we were supposed to have the conference, we had only two signups. That's it. One and two. I had five times more speakers than I had attendees. And I had to postpone that event. 
And I met with those two people who purchased tickets. I refunded them. I met with them face to face, one to one, and gave them a free coaching session so that they at least got value and to apologize that we had to postpone this event. And I had to push that event three months. And I had to really look at why this did not work. What didn't work with this? And it was the, the belief that if we build it, they will come. And that's what I see a mistake that so many are making where they'll spend all their time on the product or they'll spend all their time on the, on the program or the module or the course or the podcast or the book. And then they never actually talk about it or they never put it in front of people or they never are proactive in the marketing or in the distribution of it. They just assume people will find it. But consumers are way too busy. People are just too busy. They're too consumed. There's too many other things in front of their vision. They're not paying attention. And that was a reminder that when we put something out, we have to be very intentional about how we're talking about it. My feeling is like when I talk about my conference, it's the, it, I get so excited when I talk about it now. It's the thing that lights me up. And when people see me do my lives on Instagram, I get amped up. I get energized when I talk about it because I truly believe it changes people's lives because I've seen it. I truly believe it will help people achieve their goals because I've seen it. And that energy gets carried into my voice. But this idea of, well, we'll throw up a website, we'll send out an email, and people will just see it on social media. No. that The, the days of if you build it, they will come. They do not exist anymore. We have to build it, and then we have to communicate it to, to people. We have to introduce it. We have to communicate the value of what it is. Now, I'm not always in a sales mode. So I think that's the fear is like, well, what if we're, what if you're always selling something? I'm not always in a sales mode. I'm in a sales mode right now because the conference is, is live and we're accepting people to join the conference. But after that, guess what? Probably not going to sell for a while. If you were to look back at my social media over, I mean, th there was a good eight or nine month cycle. I didn't sell a thing, didn't sell anything right? because I wanted to nurture and to warm that audience up and to build that trust and rapport. So for this time right now, over these two months, I'm going to sell during these two months. And after that, I'll go back to nurturing my audience and building trust and rapport. But I think that's the biggest lesson I've learned through, through any of the failures is stop being reactive and start being proactive. Stop waiting for your phone to ring and start making calls. Stop waiting for emails to show up and start emailing things out because at all, of the growth we've had in our businesses were a result of being proactive and not being reactive and waiting for something to happen. James, uh, thank you so much for your time. How can people get a hold of you? Thank you so much. Yeah, super easy, uh, jamespatrick.com or Instagram at jpatrickphoto. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'll link all that stuff in the show notes. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thanks so much. And that does it for my podcast guest. In the show notes, I have a link to a website page where you can find out more about my guest as well as a link to my calendar so that you and I can have a chat about how to implement intuitive branding in your organization that will have you leveraging the power of intuition to earn the trust of those that matter in under 14 seconds, which is exactly how you eliminate your competition. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my podcast series so that you don't miss an opportunity to hear of how intuitive branding has helped eliminate the competition for yet another podcast guest. Thanks, and I hope you join me for my next episode.